Hello, good morning, and welcome to uh, Bank Holiday Friday. That doesn't trip off the tongue. Uh, Shamble Stay at Home Festival. And today, just tell you what we've got coming up. We have uh, Luke Daniel Peacock, who uh, is going to talk a little bit about the song that he's going to be singing, and then he's going to be singing that song. And we also have uh, one of my my favourite academics, um, someone who, if you've ever seen some of the, the wonderful debates that she's done, particularly on the, uh, there was a period of, of the big questions where uh, she popped up many, many times, and it is uh, always a delight to see her talking uh, about religion and the bible and the stories and the myths around it and many different ideas is francesca stavrokopoulou and we also have a josie long of course as usual hello good morning josie hello i'm very excited because at the start of the lockdown i ordered this t-shirt from uh 125 rye lane books and on the back of it there's a i can't even get it oh it's a hard one to do that one isn't it yeah there's a um pictorial graphic still of, uh, not quite working it's like a bad first shot of robert de niro trying to show, show his tattoos on cape fear yeah exactly um it's like Do you want to go off screen and just twist it round and so it becomes the front no okay <laughs> oh yeah i could do it no, I mean, yeah off screen no, no, no. please thank you that's it's weird because my show farmer tell- uh blowing snot at the landlord from uh, well, shift the camera down a bit. Shift the camera down. We can't quite all stand up. There we cartoon go. Cartoon from 1923, and it's the tenant oh, wow. farmer blowing snot at the landlord. <laughs> right on books. Very I think exciting. used to be my regular bookshop uh, many years ago, oh, and it was it, if it's the one that I'm thinking yeah. of, and uh, it was a brilliant bookshop. I- I bought, uh, amongst other things, I bought this one of my favourite books of all time. It is, uh, I have them always at Psychotronic Video Guide. Wow, this Great is so apt. To, to films that you may well never need to see. Uh, Angel of Destruction, Angel of the Amazon, Angels of Dirty Faces, Animal Instincts, Animal Instincts 2, Mad Ron's Previews from Hell. Just a few of the great uh, things in that particular uh, academic tone. That's a wonderful t-shirt. That, weirdly enough, is my show and tell, is I was thinking I'll do t-shirts today. And I was looking for the t-shirt I had signed by by Miranda Richardson. Oh, um, because about I think it was 1988, it might be 1987, but 88, I think it was. There was a thing called Shop Assistance, and it was where in Covent Garden, all of the shops had a celebrity working behind the counter, you know, Helena Bonham Carter, Jonathan <laughs> Ross, that kind of thing. <laughs> and the only person I wanted to meet because I was such a big fan of both Dance with a Stranger and Blackadder 2 was Miranda <laughs> Richardson. Oh, she's so incredible in that. So, so, and such a great actor generally, really. Uh, but I couldn't find that one. So what I did find, though, why I've never got rid of this, I don't know. My first ever Smiths T-shirt born, bought from a market in Staines. Uh, there we go. That's uh, Morrissey, uh, Billy Fury somewhere there, Oscar Wilde, James Dean. <laughs> and for the real aficionados of great early 90s groups, uh, one of my first eBay purchases was a T-shirt of the band Cud. <laughs> Change because I'm rich and strange. I remember Cud. One. Holy That's Moses, a crew t-shirt. Again. That's worth a lot of money. Yeah. I love the band Cud. If you don't, uh, Reeves and Mortimer as well, big fans of uh, the, the band Cud. So, um, well, today's show, uh, tell you a couple of other things as well, just that you you might like to know, is we have a tip jar at the bottom, as usual, that has been used over the last uh, seven weeks for us to build up a fund for artists and art centres, and we've so far given away about £15,000, and I hopefully we'll have another few thousand to give away as well. Um, please also go and support us via Patreon, because Patreon is the thing that we use to make all of the show, not just these shows, but all of the stuff that we make throughout the year when it's not locked down all of the book shambles all of the science films all of the podcasts all of those things so if you can go to patreon it says book shambles on the patreon thing at the moment but actually it means everything that we make and also to say that shambles which one shambles shambles the shambles shambles even our patreon account is a shambles um and also to say that uh this is uh, next week is the final week that we're going to be doing these shows on a daily basis we it will be the eighth week the end of the eighth week uh we're going to stop doing them every single day it, it's been a lot of fun to do them and it's been fantastic to know that for some of you that kind of connection and contact which was the original reason that we really started it was we were thinking we were getting kind of messages from people and seeing a sense of people on social media of like going oh where have all the live gigs gone 
on and where's that thing so we so we started doing it for that reason but after eight weeks we're, we're still going to do shows it's just that they're not going to be every single day uh because we uh for various different it's reasons we're unable it is it's a lot, lot to do it's and it's a lot to organize and um yeah and it's been eight weeks and also i think things will start to shift a little in the coming sort of weeks and so we can't necessarily do it ourselves because we might have to be doing other things one day we might get a job that pays <laughs> uh, in this dreamy land um but we will um but we will still be doing regular shows that will be and the whole of next week we'll be doing our final week of daily shows at uh, 10 a.m and some at 10 30 a.m and we've got phil jupiter and sean mccauliffe and jess hitchcock and uh loads of, of of really great guests talking about many many different things different ideas uh also my friend rebecca payton um who uh i interviewed if any of you have read uh, the book that i did you might know of rebecca uh rebecca's um story and her dealing with uh, grief is something which is all always uh educational and useful and if you get a chance watch the uh rebecca did a fantastic speech at tedx brixton um and it's it's up on youtube go and have a look at that it's it's a really useful and brilliant piece of work and she is witty and wise and she is on with us on tuesday mm. but should we now introduce our guest yes that would be great oh um, i'm gonna pause, take a yes. pause at 11 o'clock um because uh, people are observing um, some a minute silence, maybe two minutes silence, minute silence but we're going to yeah, take yeah. two minutes silence uh, just because otherwise I think it'd be a bit gaudy, be a bit gaudy chatting away. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, but also because my sort of Quaker spirit is like, for all victims of war. <laughs> That's well, what we're observing it for. That, that, is of, that, that is, you know, so what it's about. In fact, we'll start off. We'll throw you in the deep end, Francesca, so for joining us. Thank you so morning. much for joining us. Good morning. Uh-huh. Good morning. You're welcome. Well, that, this is what we were talking about just before we started about the fact that this is one of those awkward things that's happened, which is this is an important day to remember. This is an important day to remember all of the things that were happening across Europe. And, you know, and, and when we remember that when we remember, you know, Buchenwald and Auschwitz and we remember that for all of us, we probably have friends who grew up without at least one parent because uh, they lost. Enjoy that. You know, this is and there is and then people of a liberal mindset we start to get worried has it been entirely kind of you know kidnapped and taken hostage by yeah repurposed that's a great way of putting it yeah how do you feel how do i feel about that i say i mean i have to confess that you know walking down my street um yesterday before the clap um before the clap (laughs) um before the clapping for uh our carers um Lots of people have got Union Jacks hung out and, you know, big flags and stuff like that in readiness for today. And and I am of that kind of liberal mindset where I think, oh, because we are so aware that it's been hijacked by uh, a particular ideological um, position in which it's all about, you know, British or even English exceptionalism, um, which which I find very uncomfortable. But having said that, I do think these sorts of days are important. Um, One of the things that I do in my professional life is write obviously a lot about ancient religion and particularly about the dead and about corpses and about ways of um, dealing with both bodies and the memories of of the dead. And that's what's so important. I mean, essentially in the ancient world, you only existed for as long as you were remembered. Mm. Um, So even though there wasn't necessarily a belief in an afterlife, like in that very kind of Western Christianized tradition that we have it today, there was still a sense that the dead continued to have a social relationship with the living and the living had that relationship with their dead and and you did only exist for as long as you were remembered and that remembered involved that remembering involved rituals and kind of special days and literally saying the name of the dead aloud um so in a way this is our kind of this is almost like an echo of that and and it is of course it's, it's remembering all the dead not not just you know the kind of the brits and the americans and it's it's remembering everybody that was caught up in what was just horrific and it's hard to imagine isn't it i mean because i'm not of that generation where i mean my grandfather my english grandfather fought in the war but he died just before i was born so i've not really heard those stories i mean i know i mean my grandmother had this nazi flag that he had kind of he was helping liberate some of the concentration camps, I think, in Ger- in Poland, um, and took this sort of, as they all did, they took a lot of troops, took memorabilia, I suppose, that's the best way to say it. And she had this flag and she donated it to a local museum because it was in his stuff that she went to after he died. And and it's it's strange that we kind of, you need material and social 
stuff, events, objects, things in order to help us to remember. So, yeah, two minute silence, I think, is really important today. And I think also it's a some I think also it's to some extent as well to make sure that we uh remain active with these things in terms of reading around it in terms of informing ourselves i think it's very easy for us to uh do sometimes those things where we we remember to wave a flag that silence or applause or whatever it might be but then beyond that two minutes that five minutes whatever that bit of going i need to know more about this you know whether it is the nhs or whether it is what yeah. happened in world war Two, or you know reading primo levis if if this is a man or, or whatever it might be yeah, it's very depressing. I think to look at like the way the centenary of the First World War uh, was kind of uh, turned into uh, a sort of uh, uh, reimagining of that war as a noble exercise and not as a massacre. And, like it's sort of very people weird. who were there at the time, who wrote things at the time, explaining how awful these things were and how they should never happen again, are like just pushed to the side. <laughs> and and I do worry about like the lack of education about just the basic details of why certain things, you know, why the wars ended and who ended them and that sort of thing. Yeah. Ooh, but there we are. The first world war is the one that the first world re- war is the one that I was just reading about that the other day and just realizing that the whole, the beginning of that, the Archduke Ferdinand, the whole thing was so, it, it was so clumsy. It was someone went off to uh, assassinate him and then failed and then went to go and get a sandwich. And then it just turned out that Archduke Ferdinand's car happened to go down the same street. And he went, Oh, I was just getting a sandwich, but I've still got the, gu-. I mean, that, <laughs> this, 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 this clumsy act of assassination then leads to, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the fact that um my my dad's family and my dad in particular has always been very careful when someone's died to to make sure keep all of those important things and so i have all of my granddad's letters from the trench in the first world war you know the the somme and places like that and uh and and having that that history that that tangible history i think is is that connection is really important sorry there we are that's so anyway to at uh, at 11 o'clock um we might get to 11 o'clock with me finishing this monologue the way i'm yeah. you know, this morning i'm sorry i've had an extra coffee and i've been watching things about space exploration so i'm overly excited he's ever so- so excited i like for parenting this morning where we watched a lot of dinosaur based television which i felt bad about but you're like it's very educational and what they songs with dinosaurs and what songs did they sing? What the, songs did they sing in the educational prehistory you were oh, watching? There's a song about uh, the farting dinosaur and how <laughs> the dinosaur does massive farts, and I presume it's historically accurate. <laughs> well, it might be because one of the theories about how the dinosaurs died, how the dinosaurs died, was actually that uh, there was a leaf that was used to help digestion, and that plant died out, and they all died. Uh, really? basically, yeah, yeah, from constipation. It turns out it's more likely to have been involved with that that meteorite, but nevertheless, constipation <laughs> was a theory until the late seventies. Um, Francesca, you've got a show and tell for us this morning, haven't you? Um, I'm a bit embarrassed. I've been watching. Uh, Grayson Perry's art show on Channel 4, which is just one of the most amazing, brilliant, wonderful things to watch in this time of of just kind of existential crisis. Um, And I was inspired to make something. And I've made um, my own ancient goddess amulet. I'm going to hold it up to the camera. Can you see her? Oh, yeah, cool. So she's a copy. I say copy. She's a a mock-up of... uh, (laughs) And honestly, I thought I was so much better at art than it turned out. (laughs) Um, but she's a copy of a of a 13th century BCE um, artifact that was found at Revadim, which is in what is now southern Israel. And uh, as you can see, she's uh, got ne- like she's got lovely necklace and bangles on. She's got tattoos on her upper thighs, and she's holding open her labia. Um, interestingly enough, just as a little sort of you know PS to that, um, when I was in Jerusalem um, a couple of years ago. In fact, when I was last in Jerusalem, I decided to get my first ever tattoo. And I decided to have tattooed on me um, exactly what this, the original artifact has tattooed on her thighs. Now, you can't see it in this deeply impressive artifact here. But actually, it's little, um, she's got little caprids nibbling from Tree of Life on each of her thighs. This was the kind of, um, in fact, I can show you a picture of the original. Yes. That's her there. Wow. She's lush, isn't she? Yeah. Lush. So I decided that she had these tattoos. It's, it's little goats nibbling on a tree of life, which looks a little bit like an early, a very, 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 very early menorah. That's where the menorah's huh. style came from. So I decided to get this tattooed on my wrist. 
uh, my first and only tattoo, not get, ever getting one again because um, it really bloody hurt. It doesn't. It's it really hurts. It really hurt me, honestly. Um, I was like, oh. and I FaceTime my mum afterwards to say, "Hey, mum, yeah, drew some, yeah, great, fine, brilliant, brilliant, yeah, going off into the Sinai Desert in a couple of days. By the way, I've got a tattoo." And she was horrified. <laughs> and so I started telling her about the tattoo and why I'd got it. So I got as far as telling her about the goddess holding open her labia <laughs> and then it dropped, the signal dropped. And so my last <laughs> image just come on say, oh, as she suddenly feared that I tattooed my genitalia. But I, I haven't, it's it's on my wrist. But anyway, this is this is my show and tell goddess. And she was she was really important before um you know, b- before the patriarchal system of Yahweh worship, so the original god of the Bible called Yahweh, uh, this was his wife. Um, and probably called the goddess Asherah in around that region. She was kind of a similar kind of goddess to Mesopotamian Ishtar or Sumerian Inanna. Um, and she was amazing. And the whole point of her and the whole reason I like her is that it was a celebration, a veneration of the power of the body and in particular the female body. And not just because of fertility. You know, it's not just, oh, you know, women want to get pregnant, men want to have kids. You know, let's have one of these amulets in our home. It was all about a celebration of, of the power of the body and the inside, outside, um, sort of liminal power, magic of the female body and a proper celebration. So in the original artefact, which uh, I couldn't, you know, not shown on this model, she's got a little, she's got two little babies at her breasts. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, yeah, I just think she's fabulous. And it's about the kind of the materiality of the female body. And when you compare someone like her to someone like the Virgin Mary, yeah in which it's about the denial of the body, so much so that Mary herself is born from a virgin in some traditions, so much so that she's a virgin, she doesn't have kids, so much so that the most kind of bodily she really gets is spraying a bit of breast milk at at monks in, you know, in the medieval period, as you see in some European paintings. But a complete denial of of her body and her womanliness. And that's also her as an agent of power. And like, it's, it's exciting to hear about, her, uh, it's exciting to hear about this goddess but it's also just so devastating to think oh and then what people did was they just wrote all of them out of history yeah and and it's just devastating to think and those effects are still born by all of the women all of the do. Actually, and, you know what i found i was doing i i'm, I'm so, so you know when i was little um when i drew princesses or whatever when i was little i always gave them blonde hair Despite the fact that I had dark hair, I didn't imagine that princesses and beautiful, you know, beautiful ladies looked like I looked. And that, and it's a part of that very westernized sense of, you know, othering what is dark and different and all that kind of stuff. And I was shocked because admittedly I'd, I'd had a, oh, I'd had a few glasses of wine. Um, and I was shocked that I tried to give her blonde hair at one point. <laughs> Which is awful, isn't it? But, but it's I'm worried so because I think, I think... <laughs> No, no, I'm I just worried you made a voodoo it. doll of yourself and you must guard it. Well, it kind of, yeah, it's like a, in the real sense of the word, like something that is protective and powerful and, and needs to be carefully looked after. So I'm going to stick a couple of magnets on her and put her on the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Josie, you were going to say something. No, I was going to say it's like um, when Madonna had uh, Jesus, who was African American, and everyone in America was like, "What?" I and know. It's like, guys, just just think about where Jesus was from in the world, guys. <laughs> just, I mean, just have a think. Yeah, exactly. That whole sense that I mean, I remember discovering. I've been mean, like astonished to discover when I was about eleven, like in a religious education class at school, that Jesus was Jewish. Huh. and of course he was Jewish and he obviously you know obviously he's Jewish but like that, that kind of sense that somehow they always downplayed kind of... that bit though oh totally I know there's a lot yeah I mean honestly the gospel of John is one of the most anti-semitic ancient texts uh in the world but there is that sense in which this again it's like that hijacking of something and making it re-culturally repackaging it you know making making it in our own image and so yeah I like my goddess a lot well, that's it. Have you seen? Because I, you, you, you read proper, you, you, um, tomes. you read proper um, tomes, whereas I like comic books. Uh, but there's a, a really good comic book called uh, I'm sure we've mentioned this before, Fruit of Knowledge: The Vulva versus the Patriarchy, <laughs> and and it is, and it's the whole history of what you were just talking about. All of these images 
that have you know that that were part of you know, gargoyle like images those images to ward off evil and they all included you know images of the vulva and all and that and that is uh, yeah. to me a fascinating i mean that must be so much of, of your work must be going wow isn't it incredible how quickly something which has sometimes been part of culture for centuries can be erased yeah and and the role of the Bible in that in particular is it's appalling. It's, it's, it's a kind of brutal history of silencing and erasing and reworking. I mean, the Bible, I think, again, you know, what I like about artifacts, especially about um, female or feminized artifacts, is that it reminds you of the, how important it is to be able to have something to hold and to touch. Like it's the materiality, the visuality of ancient religion was so different. When you read the Hebrew Bible or and the New Testament now, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament now, it's all about the words. It's all about, and it's all about in the New Testament, especially it's all about belief, what's going on in your head. And that somehow words and beliefs and theologies and ideas are somehow more spiritual, they're higher, they're more intellectual, they're better and they're masculine. Whereas compared to the kind of the fleshy, muddy, clay reality of bodies and, and particularly female bodies being somehow lesser and dirty. And you just and see it reflected in discourse and in society now all the time. You know, you see people p- behaving I've, as if their objectivity is like the ultimate goal and the, and the yeah. other people's. God, it's so funny. It's so bleak to sort of feel the fumes of it all around you the whole time. But it's weird as well because there's you know you, you see a lot of like neo-pagan um movements today which i absolutely love um I, I just think they're amazing but they you can you can see how religion is trying to they're trying to reinstate the goddess as it were you know to kind of and her relationship you know environmentally and, and ecologically with the earth and with humans and animals and which is all brilliant and i love that but you kind of see though how it's still very ingrained in these very westernized patriarchal models and tropes it's still it's still about the, a reinvention it's not kind of a going you know people think that they're reclaiming this ancient past where the goddess was supreme and and she wasn't i mean she was she was the whole point was that she was a a social being who had to work with and alongside male and masculine deities um the whole point was you had to have a group and you had kind of like gender was very fluid particularly for gods and goddesses it was massively fluid so you could have you know gods and goddesses who, who could turn men into women and women into men and, and who could exhibit these very masculine or very feminized traits and tropes and you know it wasn't life wasn't quite as as easy um in that sense for humans who tended to be more strictly policed socially in terms of their gender but yeah it was all about diversity um, and that's just been completely, you know, even for those groups that try to reinstate the goddess today, you know, this sense that somehow we all used to worship goddesses, um, you know, like in those amazing temples in Malta, where it's just these brilliant, big, fat, healthy goddesses with big boobs and big bums and big vaginas. You know, it, that's, it's not as if we all started off as worshipping the mother and then kind of was slowly sort of, you know, she was killed off by the father. I mean, there are elements of that. But there was always about the diversity um of bodies and the diversity of genders and sexes and and yeah it's something that i do think about quite a lot when was the because i i picked up a book by the artist uh, by the artist uh, merlin stone who wrote the the when when god was a woman i think the one i've got is the, is the paradise papers but is that that was i think early 70s yeah is that when this really started to to return into the mainstream or or have there been throughout the 20th century various periods of time where people have tried to uh, say here's the history which is very often crossed out yeah i mean or, you know really i mean you know since god at least the 18th century in the western intellectual tradition you've had a lot of writers trying to um reinstate the place of the goddess or say you know this is how it really was um but I think particularly with the rise of, you know, feminism and feminism being taken seriously intellectually and not just politically and socially, but as an intellectual movement, um, it was it was really big. But, yeah, I I think it's always been there and it tends to be, you know, we do. I'm so aware that I make uh, when when I'm writing and researching, you know, you, you've got to be so aware that we do project our own assumptions and biases and preferences into what we do we can't but help it you know there's no such thing as we said as objectivity everything is very subjective and so even with this very intellectualized movement of kind of reinstating you know 
pre monotheistic religions and and pre the kind of the, the religions of the book you know so islam judaism christianity um before that kind of dominance that cultural dominance there there were still you know efforts to 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 try to to talk about what the origins of religion were um before those religions emerged but i i think they were still made very much in the model of those that were writing so people like Merlin Stone um you know and look at the neo-pagan movement in particularly in in Britain at the beginning of the 20th century which was really um was a lot of that was made up and based on Victorian retellings of you know what myths and rituals in in pre-Christian Britain were really like and drawn well, well, sorts of well let's I'll tell you what I was just going to say let's let's come back and uh with 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 your question Josie in in three minutes time uh we're just going to go to a hold screen now for about two and a half uh minutes for 11 till two minutes past 11 and then we'll be back with uh, Josie and Francesca and any questions that you might have as well Um, welcome back, everyone. Yeah, uh, what we were talking about before then, the only comment I was then, about the only was, comment I, was I just love that the Victorians were like, we know what happened. We know. We'll just say it all. This is what happened in medieval times. This is what happened. Like, they just, the confidence of it. They were massive, massive like, like, collectors of culture, you yes. know, like, it was that sense of, you know, the great British Empire and then going around the world and collecting everything from you know tree species to to what you know to knowledge and it was this sense of kind of collecting and kind of cataloging everything and and you know we owe them a huge amount in that sense I mean obviously we have to try and dismantle the filter and um, you know <laughs> that they put around it but yeah I mean we, we do owe them a, a lot and they weren't nearly as as worried about sex it seems as everyone likes to think you know they weren't I don't think they were really kind of worried about masturbating over piano legs were they i don't know oh that's the thing that i found out that i was so disappointed about so disappointed about it turns out that was a rumor apparently made up about americans 
but I, it was like we've heard about Americans. If they get a piano in their house, they get all sexy over it. Apparently, <laughs> it's, 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 that and I think the other the other big one is the uh, obviously the Ruskin story, Ruskin and, um, and pubic hair, which I think a lot's been written about in the last few years about how that might have actually been uh, sordid rumours uh, in uh, while someone else was having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard about Ruskin. He was terrified. It was a werewolf. <laughs> ran away. Um, but that—that that is. Um... I was going to ask you, uh, you, I know that you've had, you know, when you've made programmes, there are certain things where there's greater consternation. And I think also there is, in fact, something I want to pick up on, which is one of the issues we have sometimes when we're trying to get to what is a, a greater level of evidence-based truth, sometimes that also feeds into the narrative we have now, which is people finding the truth that fits them best. I mean, that's one of the hardest things, isn't it, is finding that level of critical thinking. Because I'm sure you've had things which you've come up with through evidence-based thinking, and people feel that they can just knock it aside because they've found their separate truth. They've found yeah. it and they've found a few websites and they've found, you know, some 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 maverick pseudo historian who has allowed them to have the truth that they want. Yeah. And it's, you know, and, and particularly when it comes to things like politics and God, you know, what's going on still. And I can't ever see it being resolved, you know, um, territorial and ideological disputes between Israel and Palestine. I mean, when I made a programme about King David and uh, sort of suggested on that programme that he probably didn't exist. Um, some scholars would disagree with me, but saying he probably didn't exist. And, and you know, there wasn't this kind of great kind of kingdom. Yes, you know, there was, you know, w historically we can start to talk about ancient Israel. Re archaeologically, only really from about the 9th to the 8th century BCE rather than the 10th century BCE, which is David, or even earlier than that, you know, Moses, Abraham, all fictional, you know, not deliberately to kind of try and dupe people. Um, but, you know, they're mythic figures and you can't get back to it. It's like talking about King Arthur. It's like, well, mm, yeah, what you know, we can't possibly know. So, um, so that that can create some problems because then you inevitably, whenever you talk about the Bible or Middle Eastern territories you, you inevitably get accused of um you know batting for one side or the other or trying to undermine um or confuse but the debates that are really difficult and i'm not an expert on modern middle eastern politics of course i'm not um but it is hard but then even when even even in my own field you know even within the university and academic setting there are still um as rob and i were talking not so long ago there, there are still a lot of my colleagues who believe when in you know the bible's claims that jesus was not only the son of god but you know resurrected from the dead and then was taken up to heaven and and they believe that although they're brilliant scholars you know they can they can sit back and and examine the texts and and you know look at the archaeology and look at the history of of religion and religious ideas in that part of the world see it as see early christianity as exactly what it was which was a subset a, a, a minor jewish cult and they can see all that and yet they can still say yeah but i believe it happened and you know we know it happened you know that why would why would these writers say that he resurrected from you know from the dead after three days you know it was a if you read um Tom Holland's recent book, uh, Dominion, which is um, quite a read, I have to say, and there's most of which, and I'm sorry, Tom, if you're watching, I completely disagree with um, everything that he basically wrote in it. But um, there is a sense in which it's this, you know, it's it's this kind of sense that somehow you can, you know, why it must have been a, a shameful thing for Jesus to have been crucified, you know, which was a method of execution, executed as a criminal. So surely... They couldn't, you know, his followers couldn't have made it up that he was crucified. And surely, you know, really would they have made up that he that he resurrected from dead? Something must have happened. It's that kind of mindset. Think, well, like, but if you've done your research and, you know, a lot, a lot of my colleagues, they do the research. They, they're far cleverer than me, a lot of them. And, and yet they still maintain that, yeah, this happened. It's a truth. Which I just it's a hard it. thing, though. Is it? I mean, because that's what I'm trying to think is because I, th that is what we were talking th about. That it's what we were talking about a few weeks ago, which is there is a part of the brain where the necessity, and I don't mean that as a physical, you know, I mean, it probably is, but let's not, we, there's going to be a long time before we find out about that. But the point that this place where certain needs of truth exist, where the debating brain, where the evidence brain, where the critical thinking brain doesn't seem to be able to access it. Yeah. If you see what I, and that to me is one of the most fascinating things, which and is. I, I like that. I like it because it's that part of the brain that, 
There is. There is about religious emotion. And I think I think sometimes, you know, we need to take seriously the sensory, um, almost physical aspects of emotion that leads to something like that, like that, not this, but obviously in the ancient world, something like this. It's that sense of the magic. And I think we should call it magic. It is like that, but it is that that part of the brain that that responds to and craves another way of being in the world, mm. some kind of access to another kind of world altogether. And that, that does seem to be something that's very deeply rooted in human beings um, and in human society, not just human. I mean, I, you know, you look at very social groups of animals like elephants and chimpanzees and stuff, and they also seem to have something of a sense of of that magic about the worlds in which they live. Look at the way elephants treat their bones and look at the way, you know, chimps treat their dead babies and stuff like that. There's a sense that they're engaging on that kind of level as well. They all got very excited when they saw the obelisk, didn't yeah. they? Because they knew. That's the thing, they knew. They knew. <laughs> That's good, because I was writing about that this morning. This morning. That what brilliant the story. About the Sentinel, yeah, the original story and what it, uh, but you, because Francesca, well, that's what we're talking about is that bit where I, I, I've been banging on about this all week, but it's something everyone should see the Jane Goodall documentary, the most recent one that, that, that came out. I think Brett Morgan was the, the director. And when you watch the, and I know it's always this is the thing we were talking about a few weeks ago that difficulty of dividing between the way that we project our empathy uh onto other creatures and they're anthropomorphized but when you look in 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 the film there is a lot of footage of when the chimpanzee group when they got polio when there was a huge epidemic there and there's also the relationship between a mother and child that you see played out and and it i see that that be the idea that there would be a, a point of evolution of intelligence where only we it would suddenly only this yeah. would develop any form of of of, of empathy of a, that that seems to be on you this is not based on any science but it just seems to me somehow it doesn't quite sit with me happily but that might be one of my faith-based but, i mean and equally it might be one of mine as well because i'm a massive fan of animals huge fan of animals all animals and and i am you know quite sort of soppy about them but you know we do talk about should we anthropomorphize animals but 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 is that really what's going on i mean is is it maybe it's just that we're not recognizing that we are far more like animals that you know oh, oh should we not animalize ourselves more to say this part of us, you know, this kind of, this bit of us that can maintain social relationships with the dead, like elephants seem to be able to, or chimps, uh, you know, is that not something that's an animal part of us rather than a, a human part of us? I, I don't know. I don't I'm know. worried I anthropomorphise humans. I think I might be projecting way too much more on some of the ones that I on see. Some than, of the ones uh, that I see than uh, than is true. <laughs> um, Francesca, we better uh, wind up. And um, what? Where can people find? I know you're working on a book, so they can't get your book yet. Yeah, but it's uh, coming out next March, and it's very exciting about God and God's body, and um, it's got pictures, but also lots of words. Um, and yeah, uh, it's it's basically God had a big willy, and uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Brilliant. so yeah but follow me on twitter because i'm always yapping on twitter and sort of talking about this kind of stuff over there so um find me at twitter at prof francesca and or just yeah have a look at google some of my stuff some of my books are on google books and there are a lot of fun and look. there are a lot of fun as i said on youtube and stuff like that a lot of fun stuff from debates you've done and events at conway hall and things like that yeah so, yeah, so yeah go and have a look at those. on youtube as well so yeah check it out the main thing is I'm relieved that your new book is not a pop-up book. Uh, so, um, Josie, uh, what, I know some of the things you're doing today. Uh, I'm doing tonight. Uh, we do a regular Friday night comedy club, which is loads of fun. Um, and I think we're not doing one next week. So if you want to watch it, you should watch it now. Otherwise, you've got a two-week wait. It's at half past eight on this same stream here. And it's John Luke Roberts, Johnny and the Baptist, siblings, and Mark Thomas and me. And it'll be lots of fun. Uh, it's it's a, a bit of a messy space where we're quite silly for an hour. And, um, yeah, we'd love you to join us. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Brilliant. And, uh, also, Brilliant. and uh, also over the weekend, there's the Kids Science Show tomorrow at uh, 11 o'clock. And on Sunday, it's Hannah Fry and John Butterworth and Helen Chersky and me will be doing the uh, science Q&A. I do the Qs, they do the As. I don't get involved in the As whatsoever. And then next week, uh, we're back for Monday to Friday. That's, the, as I said, the, the last week that we're going to be doing a daily show. Uh, I'm really glad that a lot of you have kind of, you know, got in contact with us and that you have found it useful in terms of connection and all of those things. We will keep doing shows after useful. that. It's been it's great, been fun, isn't it? it? Just to show up, look 
dopey in the background it's been brilliant um robin so on sunday night i'm streaming my stand-up show tender at 8 30 p.m and i'll be doing that every thursday and sunday night on, on um this stream except for the 17th and on my twitch as well so brilliant that too people brilliant that too and I would just mention my, my T-shirt today, I mentioned T-shirts before, is uh, Bill Oddie. That's from the uh, festival back in January. And uh, it's just gone up. Some of you might have heard we, we had an audio version of the uh, 50th anniversary uh, goodies show where I interviewed the goodies and we showed various clips. And uh, it's now live as well. Actually, the, the, the full filmed version is up and you can find that on this channel. Uh, so go to Cosmic Shambles and, you, and you'll find and also find all the stuff about Slapstick Festival. And I think we're doing a watch along as well. As, as i've said before of course now it is uh it's it's in some ways it's a bittersweet celebration but i'm so glad that celebration could happen uh and it was it was a fantastic night with tim graham and bill so uh do take a look at that um it was yeah it was a fantastic thing to be a part of and the the audience there were just so excited it was yeah the whole thing was great um so some of us will see you tonight some of us will see you tomorrow some of us will see you next week remember the tip jar if you can please subscribe to uh, youtube and also go and look at our, our patreon so we can keep making all of the other ridiculous we've got a lot of plans for a lot of ridiculous shows uh to replace what has been a daily show uh, as i said all next week we're on we start with phil jupiter on monday rebecca payton tuesday and uh sean mccauliffe on uh wednesday and jess hitchcock as well and lots of great stuff um now we're going to leave you with uh another great uh, as you know support as many artists you can via band camp and things like this and uh, here is one of those artists you support so uh, to end the show here is daniel luke peacock Remarkable recent song. I've got a bunch of new stuff coming though, so if you want to find out more, uh, just I'm pretty easy to find. Just look up Luke Daniel Peacock, chuck that into your search bar thingy, and and you should find me. Um, very chilled vibes here at the moment in in ISO. It's pretty early in the morning, and um, yeah, taking it very easy. So here's a here's a very chill version of my song called Older Van. Thank you very much again.
Huh?